Uh, yes, guys, the recordings will be provided to you all uh, in few days as the recordings are yet to get ready. We'll make sure that we will upload the recording on our official YouTube channel and we'll definitely share the uh, recording links with you all on your register email IDs. Uh, yes, uh, Pradha, uh, it's the same code which we have shared yesterday. So those who have yet to get the batch activated, it is for them. So if you have activated the batch yesterday, no need to uh, follow the steps and get the batch activated again as it is there on your profile. I'm asking other participants, those who have missed on to get the batch activated. Yes, guys, we'll start now with the day two of AZ-900. Uh, welcome you all again in this day two of AZ-900. We have uh, Mansi Shane with us for day two. She will continue the topics as we have uh, left yesterday, wherever we have left yesterday. Then moving ahead. Uh, also, please make sure you get uh, understand the learning plan, which we will share with you. As we have completed, uh, as we will complete the one day of webinar, that is AZ-9 and Threat 8 hours of uh, training. Uh, we, we have provided you with the learning achievement badge, which indicates the self-learning uh, plan. Also, there will be a mentoring and exam prep session. So we have uh, added a section in a feedback form where you have to mention your queries and questions related to the AZ-900. By the end of this session, we will share the feedback form link. In that link, you have to just mention your queries and questions related to the topics and the concepts uh, which has not been answered. And we will take an exam prep session for hour and two hour maybe, and we'll cover all your questions. We'll make sure you get the indications a day before whenever we plan the exam prep session. Also, there will be a knowledge assessment uh, like a practice test by the end of the session, which you all have to attend. We'll share the link for this uh, assessment by the end of the session. So make sure you attend the assessment. Check your, uh, you know, check your knowledge, how much you have got to learn through this easy 900 webinar. Then as I have mentioned, we have shared the learning achievement batch uh, for AZ-900. We have shared uh, the URL yesterday itself. So those who have yet to get the batch activated, the URL has been mentioned in the chat box for you all. 
you just have to simply uh, go and create your learn profile. Uh, once you create your learn profile, you have to click the URL which has been shared with the steps and get the batch activated. Also, may uh, please uh, note this batch includes all the study material for AZ900, the modules, uh, courses and learning path related to AZ900 certification. So I will request all the participants to get the batch activated. So you all can go and do the revision through this batch. Also, you can share this batch on your uh, learning uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter profiles. Uh, if you are if you are still facing uh, any problem while the redemption of the batch do let me know in the chat box uh, we are there to help you out throughout the session also we will keep a half an hour uh, time time for the let's say for the q a session as well as for the learning achievement batch redemption at that time you all can go and uh, submit the feedback form you can ask your questions and queries on that feedback form which will be covered in the exam prep session as well as you can ask the queries and doubt if you are getting while the redemption of the learning achievement batch i will help you out there Thank you all. Uh, now uh, I would like to hand over the mic to the speaker so she can go ahead with the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Chaitani. Uh, can you confirm whether you can, uh, my voice is proper? Yes, you yes, can we can me? hear you. Yes. Okay, great. So let's continue uh, with where we stopped yesterday. So let me do a quick revision, okay, of what we did yesterday so we started with the fundamental cloud concepts we understood the different types of concepts the different services of in cloud sorry and first of all we understood what was the scenario before cloud came in okay what were the challenges what were the difficulties that one faced when they were working when cloud was not there okay then we moved we got into the depth, we understood the benefits of cloud, why one should have cloud, okay? And we then moved on with the popular cloud that is Azure, and we saw the different services that are there. So we covered the three services, that is compute, networking, and storage services. So in compute, we have the most popular and the only IS offering that is your virtual machine we saw how to create a virtual machine on the azure platform using the portal.azure.com uh, website okay the azure portal where we could create by just giving basic configurations okay how much uh, what should be the name of the vm what should be the username password to the vm similar to how you configure your machines okay similar to that we um, created a simple VM and then we moved on to understand different computing services that is the app service or uh, then the container services that is the Azure container instance and the Azure Kubernetes service. And then we saw the different networking services like Azure Virtual Network, Azure Private Network, Azure Virtual Private Network, sorry, Express Route, um, Okay, those different services that are a part of the networking uh, services on Azure. And then we finally moved on to the storage services where we particularly talked about the four different storage services that is the blob storage or the container service. service. Then we saw file system, file share, okay, queue, and table storage. This, these are the things that we talked about. And then I talked about the different redundancy options that one can have in order to replicate or copy or back up their data in simple terms. OK, so there are four options that you have. You decide which one you want. You get a flexibility for that. And then we saw there are four different access tiers, the way we can access our data. OK, depending on how frequently you access them. OK, there are four types. That is the hot, cool, cold, and the archive. Okay, These are the four access tiers that we have. And then we 
moved on and we saw how to create a simple block storage on or uh, using the Azure portal. So now moving ahead, we are going to complete module two, complete the remaining services that is the identity and access and the security services on Azure and then move to complete module three, which talks about cost management, um, how different ways of accessing Azure portal. OK, the Azure resource manager, what it is, and then some monitoring tools. We will be seeing how you can make your Azure resource much better. OK, monitor the logs, what were the errors, look after the telemetry, look after the application that you have created. OK, uh, all those things we will see in module three. So now we're going to start with the remaining part of module two. So this is what we had seen. Now moving on to the identity access and security services in Azure. Uh, Chaitali, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. See, so your screen is visible. OK, great. So uh, we are now going to see the identity access and security services on Azure. OK, how can you now once you have started, you want to work on the Azure cloud. OK, we need to first of all identify ourselves. OK, we need a way like when you go to an OTT platform also, right? You first of all, you need to put in your username and password and create credentials for it, right? You need to I put some way, some mechanism in which in a way that you can identify yourself. OK, so if I have to do that even on the Azure, the very first service that it has introduced is called as the Azure Active Directory, but this is no longer called Azure Active Directory. Just recently they have changed the name and they have made it Microsoft Entra ID. OK, uh, if you uh, this is a old this is an old slide that I have been using, so I haven't changed the name. But now recently the change has uh, there is a change that is Microsoft Entra ID. So what is this Azure Active Directory or Microsoft Entra ID? OK, normally when we are using the Azure portal, so we like I said, like you need to create your identity onto it. So where is this identity stored? OK, so normally when you're working on Azure, you have different services that you will be working in. OK, or let's talk about even the Microsoft 365 solution that we have, the SaaS service that is there. OK, then also you first of all need a license. OK, and then secondly, you need to create your own username and password. So it's the same thing if I have to do on Azure. OK, and where your identity is stored. OK, so that every time you create a resource or a service in Azure, OK, the, the identity is taken from this particular directory. So hence earlier the name was Azure Active Directory. Now it has become Microsoft Entra ID. So every time you create any service or resource, your identity is taken from where? From this particular service. That is the Microsoft Entra ID. So by using the Microsoft Entra ID, so I'll just write it down. I'll just scrap this. It is called as Entra E N T R A. This is what it is called.
now microsoft entra id okay so using this okay you can kind of authenticate yourself now authentication i will explain give, uh, in a few minutes okay so like i said you whenever you create a resource or a service on azure every time you need to identify yourself i mean it's once you log in okay it's like a identity that you have given so and in case like now uh, when you're working with databricks okay and i said that databricks has a tie up with um, it has a tie up with um, azure has a tie up with databricks okay so uh, like i said you don't need to always you know you, otherwise on databricks you would need to create a separate username password okay which as your which if you are a part of azure okay you are a part of the azure active directory you have a username password you have an identity created there okay you don't need to do that simply it navigates okay to the databricks environment to the databricks service that is there and you can start using that so instead of creating two different identities on two separate um uh, accounts uh, on two separate services sorry okay you have only one id and that is your microsoft entra id so if azure has to verify you who, that are you the person who is using the uh, who's using the uh, azure portal is using the azure cloud is a valid person or not okay it will use the authentication method okay but we will talk about what is authentication in a few minutes then if you have an azure and active directory or a microsoft entra id okay at times what happens is that you don't have to like i gave you the example like if you have one uh, azure active directory or azure and microsoft entra id okay you can navigate to different services that are a part of the azure cloud okay or uh, even open ai if you want to access you can use your i mean azure open ai not the uh, open ai given i mean not the general open ai model okay but the one that is present on the azure cloud if you want to use that you don't have to create a separate account on the open ai chat gpt portal okay you can use the same credentials of your azure login and work with it so what happens is that you get a interface of a single sign in okay like even if you consider the microsoft 365 applications right you have word you have excel you have powerpoint etc okay so you create an account and all these services inside it are available to you using the same login id and password using the same username password so you don't have to create on okay on word i need a separate identity on excel i need a separate identity so it has cracked that and you get the advantage of a single sign on so once you sign in okay automatically the because you are a part of this directory it's like a phone directory okay since you are a part of it uh, microsoft will kind of pick up your identity from there okay and then only you will get access to that specific service that you are looking for so when you work with the entra id okay you also get the benefit of a b2b okay from an organization like microsoft with another organization so like my organization that is synergetics okay we kind of also get the advantage so if i'm a part of the enterprise and my 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 organization has the appropriate subscription okay that is also very important you need to have a subscription otherwise you will, you can have an username password but in order to create resources services you need a subscription if you don't have that then you can't create a create any resource on the azure portal even though you can log in okay so every time you log in you can log in using either your uh, office id or your personal id that is the b2c so even your gmail outlook all those ids work but 
to this you need a subscription and subscription has different types it can be a free trial it can be a enterprise level subscription it can be a subscription like mine which is mct okay uh, but also in mct we have different subscriptions like i told you all you have the micro uh, there is a msdn and a vsdn subscription so on that you get a billing boundary with, within which you have to utilize the or create resources or deploy resources within it. So with this, you get the advantage. So it's like a single place where all your details about the about you, about uh, about your identity is stored, and that place is the Microsoft Entra ID. Okay. So these are the advantages that you get when you have a entra id service but now okay you have entered you you have given your username password okay so that's not where it stops okay it needs further information at times and in order to do that microsoft utilizes the concept of authentication and authorization now what is authentication so authentication is basically something that you it is basically like your ID card. Like when you go to the to your offices, like you get an ID card, which you scan at the entrance, right? And then only you get the entry in your office or in the premises of your office, right? So how does how do you get that entry? Is because you have some employee ID, you have your name, etc. in that identity card. So authentication is like basically who you are. Okay, to help you identify, like provides you a identity card. Okay, so once you have been added to the Active Directory, the first thing that it needs to do is authenticate yourself. Okay, you need to authenticate yourself. Okay, that is either you, you, you is something that you know. Okay, it's something that you are and something that you have. Okay, so we will see steps, we will see services that Microsoft you or Azure uses in order to perform these, perform authentication in order in order to access the Azure portal. Okay, what steps does it take or what services does it have in order to authenticate yourself? So authentication basically is something that you are. Okay, it's like the identity. OK, where you need to prove so with where you where your identity is stored, the service is the Microsoft Entra ID. But if I have to authenticate my identity, I have different services for that which will be applied and we will see those services in some in a minute or two. Now coming to what is authorization. So once you've logged in, OK, you have been authenticated, OK? The next step is how far or till where do you have the access in the Azure? Now, what does this mean? So at times what happens is, OK, let's talk about in terms of an organization. OK, inside an organization, like I told you, there are different departments. You have sales department, you have the HR department, you have the uh, marketing department, correct? And we, have, we can associate different subscriptions to that department and imagine like in every department we have multiple people working in it right like sales can have multiple employees working in it so you get you get the b2b microsoft enter id okay based on the organization you kind of want to authenticate but now in the sales department there can be a situation where people there are some people who are interns Right, who are not permanent employees, though they are using your micro using the organization's username password that you have allocated. Okay, like if like I am from Synergetics, so I get a Synergetics ID. Okay, so I am using that in order to access the Azure portal that my organization has. Okay, the sales department has. Okay, I am using that, but. Let's say I want I want to decide where the intern wants or till where he or she should get the access. Let's say I don't want the intern to, you know, be able to update certain things in my Azure portal. I do not want him or her to change anything 
add in more stuff, do any kind of updation in my Azure portal. His job or her job is just to do, uh, is just to read stuff, okay? Act as if, uh, just provide viewing rights, okay? So if I want that kind of accessibility to be live, to be applied, okay? That is done through the authorization. So authorization is the way to determine how far can one person go within that particular within the Azure cloud. Okay, so once you have authenticated, okay, great, but okay, see, you don't have the access to use this, this service. You are just a, let's say you're just an intern, so you are, you just have the viewing rights. You don't have the rights to, you know, update anything in the portal. Okay, so this is what is called as authorization and authorization can be based on roles. OK, it can be a role that you can allocate. OK, depending on what that person is doing, you can decide to give that person a authorization in the Azure portal. So we are going to see services, how you can authenticate your Azure portal your Active Directory, and how you can apply authorization, decide the access till where you, okay, the, uh, a person can go in the Azure portal. So coming to the first service, that is the multi-factor authentication. Now, what is this multi-factor authentication? Okay, it is like we all use banking websites, right? We all use, uh, we all do net banking right uh, either from the mobile or from the laptop correct so when we log into our uh, banking websites okay what do we do first we first of all enter something that we know that is your username and your password correct something that you know it's something that you have created something that has been given to you and you kind of enter it enter the values pertaining to it so for Microsoft, let's say this is not enough. It feels that, okay, anyone can know the username, password, okay? Like probably some other person is using your credentials and trying to log into the Azure, okay? They know the username and the password that you have given. So Microsoft thinks, okay, I, I, I don't just want the username and the password. I want something else. So what it will do, it will, Send something called as an OTP, like we always, uh, when we go into the, take the banking example itself, what is the next step once you have entered the username, the password? Next step, it says, okay, I am sending an OTP to where? To the registered mobile number. So what is that mobile that you have? It is something that you possess, right? Mobile, every everyone today has a mobile, right? From small kids to elder to uh, i mean to uh, senior citizens everyone has a mobile so what is it it is something that you possess so what it will do once you have entered the username password no worries now the next step is i want you to give me a otp okay the one time password that i have shared on something that you possess and that is your mobile phone okay so once that is done at times that is also not enough Okay, so what so Microsoft, what it will do next is ask for something that you are. Now, what is that? Either a fingerprint scan or your face facial scan. Okay, it'll take a face scan of yourself. Okay, and say, okay, once that is done, okay, now I feel you are the person who is trying to access this particular portal. Is a genuine person, it's the same person who uh you know, is has created an account on or has an active direct has a is a part of the active directory. It's the same person. Now you are authenticated. You have been identified. You can go ahead and start working on the Azure cloud. Okay, so this is one of the services that it uses. There are other services as well. Okay, uh, which is not a part of this curriculum is at 900. If you want to know more about this, you can go and do SC 900, the SC series, which deals with the identity and 
access and uh, security services, you can definitely go into that and study more about it. But as far as AZ900 is concerned, this is the only thing that you need to know. Then the other advantage, like I spoke about, okay, that if you have a Active Directory, okay, like Active Directory, you can um, be a part of the organization. So Microsoft kind of builds a trust with the organization. So in case even if you have a organization ID, okay, and you have the appropriate subscription, so Microsoft will kind of have a B2B collaboration with you. Okay, you need to be a part, you need to, that particular organization needs to be a part of the Active Directory of Azure, of Microsoft, okay. Um, so that, okay, because there is a trust built, okay, uh, once that trust is built, okay, with your registered organization, okay, you can then go ahead and access the Azure portal, okay. So this is what it means by B2B. Okay, so you first of all need to be a part of the directory service, the Microsoft Entra ID, okay, of Azure. So either you do it from B2B or you could be a B2C as well. Then you could use your personal uh, IDs, okay. You can uh, use that as well. OK, like a Gmail or whatever ID you want, but you need to be first of all, you need to go and identify yourself in the Active Directory. OK, create an account, identify yourself. OK, and then only you can then start accessing the Azure Cloud. So you can have a B2C connection as well. So this was about the authentication. The service for authentication that is there is nothing but the multi-factor authentication. Nowadays, there is an app also for it, like um, called as the Authenticator app. So if you're working on an organization like B2B, if you are working, OK, so Microsoft always and because it's at an organization or an enterprise level, it, it has become it is very critical the data that you are going to share or upload, it considers it to be a very important data. OK, so whenever you log into your Azure account using the organization ID, OK, it always uh, sends uh, like an authentic, it always sends some notification to an app that you need to install on your mobile called as a Microsoft uh, Authenticator app, which will display some number. And once that number you say, okay, you authenticate from your mobile, okay, uh, you can then kind of log into your Azure account. So these are some of the ways in which, okay, for B2B, B2C, you can configure the authentication. Now coming to the access, okay, when you're trying to access the Azure portal, Okay, or trying to even authenticate yourself. Okay, there are certain situations that can make Azure, you know, um, that can decide your um, accessibility of the Azure Club. Okay, so like even though you have authenticated, you've given your username, password. Okay, you it is. Microsoft or Azure still finds it very fishy, let's say. Okay, it, it thinks that there is something wrong with this person. Okay, so it catches something called as signals in that. And what are these signals? So probably you are, you know, from a different group or you're a different user. Okay, like though the credential is the same thing, but you have a different subscription or something. Okay, it will catch that. That is the first signal that it can get. The other signal that it can get is probably, uh, let's say you are not working from the same Wi-Fi that you were work, that you had created an account on or had started using the Azure portal from. Okay, let's say you that IP address is not the same with the one that you are using currently. So what happens is that, or probably you are working from another location. OK, it has detected. OK, I uh, you first of all, you created an account when you were in the India region. Now you are no longer there. You're working probably from United States. OK, so if there is a change in the location, OK, 
it kind of did okay this is like a signal for azure it says okay i find this something uh, not right okay i need to get this person not just authenticated using something that he knows but something more on top of that okay then uh, probably the other signal that it can receive is like you are working okay the first time when you worked on azure you used one laptop okay so every laptop has this IMEA, I mean, there is a different number associated with it, right? I was talking about mobile, sorry. So it finds, okay, the device that you're working, probably you're logging in through the mobile application. So it, if even the device changes, it feels, okay, this is something different. This is a signal. Okay, I have to be more, uh, I have to be alert. I need to apply some precaution on top of that. Okay, so what does it do? It then on top of that, it will first of all apply Microsoft uh, the multi-factor authentication. It says, okay, username, password is fine, you know, but I don't feel that okay because of these signals, I feel that there is something missing. I want more information. Okay, so there you can always apply the MFA. So these are some of the conditional access that it uses some signal that it picks up, okay, um, when you are trying to access the Azure cloud, okay? So even these things determine the accessibility of your cloud environment, okay? So like whenever even I log into my Azure portal, because the MFA is installed, so wherever I go, Okay, in whichever part of the country I am, if I have to use the Azure portal or the Azure cloud, I always need to, uh, I, there is always a MFA applied to it. So I always get an OTP on my mobile phone. Okay, whenever I try to log in and if this is from anywhere. Okay, so you can even have a general setting for MFA or you can put an MFA based on these conditions or based on these signals as well. OK, so this is how you can apply your how you can authenticate and authorize. OK, the other thing now once you have logged in, you have authenticated. OK, like I said, till where can I access the Azure cloud that I have determines the roles that have been assigned to me. Like I said, uh, when you're working in an organization, you have multiple departments and to, let's say to every department, I have given something called as a subscription, right? We saw what a subscription is, okay? So if I'm working and I'm trying to use the Azure account and I said, okay, uh, MFA is multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication. So this is MFA multi-factor authentication. Now let's say once you have entered the Azure account, you have been thoroughly authenticated. Okay. Uh, now what is the next step? Okay. So like I gave you the example of the sales department. Let's say you have a couple of interns working in your department. Okay. And you don't want, you know, to want them to make any changes to whatever services or resources you have created, okay? So in that situation, what you can do is you can use something called as a role-based access control. Now, what is a role-based access control? Or we call it as RBAC, okay? Short form is RBAC. So this particular service of Azure, okay, helps you in kind of segregating the accessibility of your subscription or on but on top of a resource group it can be you know in terms of any service that you have it's not just at the uh, resource group level or at okay um, or at the subscription level this particular service which is called as the i am identity access management okay i will show you uh, that so if I want to ask, you know, give a role to a specific person, I can do that, okay, by giving him a, 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 you know, by segregating it 
into a specific role. Like let's say an intern is there and that intern's job is just to contribute in creating VMs or managing VMs. OK, so instead of giving the access to the entire Azure account, OK, to the entire Azure subscription that I have, what I can do is I can just give it a role called as VM contributor. OK, and whatever VMs are there in your subscription will be managed by that intern. So what is happening? You're kind of giving a granular. Uh, you're making it more refined, right? Giving it a granular approach. OK, just specific to the rule. Your job is to manage VM. OK, your your limit is also till there. Your access is also till there. So this kind of granular and uh, refined pro refined way of doing is called as a role based access control. So let me show you all in the portal. OK, how you can give a role based access. So I have logged in to my Azure account. OK, so like I said, you can give access either at the subscription level. OK, or you can give the access on any of the services that you have created or even on the resource group. So if you go to any of the resource group, let's go to the resource group that we created yesterday. So if you come here, we have this service called as IAM. OK, so if you click on this. OK, come to add. And say role assignment, add a role assignment. So here you can see specific to the role, you have lots and lots of roles allocated. So there are two types of roles that you can give. One is specific to the job. Okay, like I said, VM, only VM related role you can give. So, like if I search VM. So it will list down whatever job so you can see there is a description also so you can see all the jobs specific to the VM have been listed down over here. OK, so what is this? A granular approach that you can give. OK, the other thing is that. Is the privileged administrator role So what are these roles? These are something that you is like more. <laughs> Yeah, so this is more like a privilege. OK, it's like administrator roles that you are getting on top of the for the resource group only, not for the subscription. So whatever. Um, you are working on the resource group. You can administer. OK, you can also assign roles to others. OK, because but it depends on what administrator role you have. So there are owner roles. There's a contributor role. There is a reader role that you can assign that is there. So these are the five administrator roles that you can assign to. Or if you don't want to assign administrator roles, you can definitely go with something that is more job oriented OK uh, related to the job and that is done through the job function roles. And if I have to do any role assignment, I can come to the IAM. OK, so this is for the resource group. You can even have for the subscription. So this is my subscription. So here also at the subscription level, I can assign a role. OK, I can add anyone who wants to be a part of this subscription. OK, all they need is to be a part of the directory and then they can start using my subscription and work on the Azure Cloud. OK, so these this is what we can also do at the subscription level. You can even go at a service level like yesterday we created storage account. You can even do that in your storage account. Give access only to the storage account. OK, instead of a resource group or a subscription, OK, you can just come here and give a role. 
any role, job role or something. You can even give it, give it a co-administrator. Okay, you can assign those values. So if you just click here, the same things you will see over here. And so you can see now it has changed specific to the storage account. Okay, it is displaying roles only for that. Okay, you can come and assign that over here. So this is how you can assign roles, manage accessibility in Azure. So this was the identity access service on Azure. Like I told, there are two ways that is authentication and authorization. Uh, once you have your name registered in the directory in the Microsoft Entra ID you have created, you have two ways of accessing. I mean, not two ways, but there are two ways in which you can access. OK, that is the authentication, so you need to first of all authenticate yourself and you can use the MFA that is a multi-factor authentication uh, service. Then if I have to talk about ac accessing or authorizing someone, I can do that based on the conditions that I get, based on the signals. And once that is done, I can apply a MFA to that particular condition. OK, I find something fishy. I can just put an MFA, get more information about that person, authenticate him even further. OK, using the using a registered mobile phone, using face scan or fingerprint, etc. OK, and then we talked about accessibility. OK, how can you access the Azure cloud based on the role that has been given to you? So it can be a uh, there can be two types of roles that you can give one very specific to the job and second uh, uh, administrator role. So administrator can then do the changes, etc. acts like an admin. OK, and these roles can be applied at the subscription level, at the resource level, at the resource group level also. OK, all these things can be done using the RBAC service. So this was the identity and access services. Now let's go and see some of the security services in Azure. So the very first service or not service actually, but it has a it, this is the concept that Microsoft or Azure follows in terms of its security. OK, it says that I trust no one. OK, so whenever you kind of are you know working on the Azure this thing every time you are putting up things it says okay I don't believe you I don't trust you I have very little trust okay as good as zero okay so whatever is there like even when you you have yourself registered in the active directory etc it still feels if it feels that okay I don't trust this person I have zero trust okay you can then go ahead and secure your Azure portal, even your different services. OK, like you have created a storage account and the one who's creating, let's say, for the data that you put in, you don't trust it. OK, so with this zero trust policy that Azure has, OK, you can enable or you can secure, secure your data. So anyone third party even trying to access, OK, will have to authenticate, authorize because of this zero trust policy that Azure has. OK, they will have to verify them, identify themselves, and then if they have to access the data, then only I mean they have to have a trust uh, wherein they, you know, Microsoft doesn't have a trust from the beginning. It is created later, but it does a lot of security on top of it. It applies a lot of security before and what policy is driven by that is the zero trust policy okay it says trust no one okay believe no one authenticate authorize whatever you want to do please do at every level of your whenever you're using the azure cloud the other service that it uses in order to protect anything inside the 
Azure environment is the defense in depth service. So now what is this defense in depth? This is basically like a layered approach that it takes. OK. Um, like, for example, uh, let's say you have VMs created. OK, you have uh, so VMs is what VMs comes under the compute services of Azure. Correct. They are a part of the compute services, so you can have multiple VMs. So if I want to protect the VMs, anything that I want to protect, OK, should be one layer above, meaning now VMs come here at this compute level. They come at this level. OK, your VMs are created. Over here. So if I want to protect my VMs, now what do I mean by that? I want to see, I want to, you know, uh, filter out certain IP addresses. OK, how can I do that? I can do that using a service called as the NSG. NSG means uh, network security groups. So what you do is you create groups, OK, you create IP addresses. OK, and you assign a rule to it. You assign rules OK from this IP address to this IP address is the priority. Please take them in. OK, so you assign or you allow or let's say yeah, you allow them into or in, in order to enter and access the VM. So if I want a specific IP address, I want a IP address to be allowed to use a VM. I can put a rule in the NSG. So you kind of put it in terms of groups. OK, you give a specify the IP addresses. OK, you give a priority number to that. OK, like if you get IP addresses from this range to this range, leave other IP addresses, give this a priority. So the lower the number is higher, the priority is what is in the NSG. OK, so if you have a priority number 100, so that will get the highest priority compared to something that is uh, 1000 or something, whatever number you configure, okay, 200, 300, 400, 500. So even though if you have a higher priority, uh, higher number, it doesn't mean that it will get priority first. So you have to be smart whenever you are, you know, uh, deciding the priority and the number associated to it. So if I want to protect my VMs, it comes NSG become a part of that. And it also works when you're working with a database that is also there. So you can even have database, um, actually not database, but only VMs. Database, if I want to use, if I want to protect, you would use firewall for it, okay? The firewall system that is there. Uh, you would need to use that. OK, so my compute is here, so my NSG should be a part above in the above layer. That is the networking layer. So like I said, whatever you want to protect below, OK, that particular service should be placed above. OK, and that you can do that in the networking layer. So now network, we know there are multiple networks we can have. OK, multiple VMs grouped into a network. OK, which will be a networking service like you can have a VNet. OK, you can have express route anything like right? so if you want to protect that, you need to put it in the parameter layer. So NSG is one way you have as your firewall service that you can apply over here in order to protect the network that is there. OK, networking services or VNet or anything you can apply again, decide the rules, inbound rules, outbound rules, OK, which IP addresses to allow, which IP addresses to deny, OK, all that you can configure. And for that approach, it is called as the defense in depth. OK, so this is the approach generally that is taken. And if you have, want to study about it more like SC900 is there, OK, you can you uh, for you know, to understand that in much more detail, you can definitely use that. And of course, these layers that are there, OK, they are isolated from each other. They are independent of each other. OK, not two layers interfere within each other. OK, so one, so 
it goes from a top to bottom approach is there. So you can see that physical security that is at the data center level becomes more important. Then your identity is the second layer that is, you know, kind of taken into consideration. Then, of course, the firewalls, then the NSGs, uh, etc. Those services come into picture. But you can see at the bottom, you have your data which is the most critical and the most important and which needs to be protected because we know we don't like our data being leaked, okay, which nowadays is becoming very important. So you should take the defense in depth approach in order to protect your data. Then the next service that you have on Azure is the Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Now, what is this Microsoft Defender for Cloud? Okay, it's like a, a, a service, okay, which tells you that, okay, I find this service, I mean, I don't think this is good. This service is not good, okay? It, I think you should make some changes inside that. Okay, so what is it doing? It is giving you a recommendation that please you. These are the areas that you need to focus on, where you need to improve, where you can make your service better. Okay, please look at that. Okay, here you need to have a focus and based on that, based on the analysis that Microsoft Defender does, it gives you something called as a secure score. Okay, it gives you something called as a Secure score. So you get kind of like a score, okay, which tells you how good or bad your Azure cloud is, okay, how well protected it is, okay, it will give you recommendations. So it will be like a dashboard that it will create for you. And in that dashboard, you will see a secure score, okay. It will also enlist the services that are in, you know, can have a potential threat. Okay, can be a, a, a easy target for hackers. Okay, so all that they all detect it. They also detect like the malware that is there, potential attacks that can take place. Okay, and gives you a thorough report. Okay, of all the analysis it has done. Okay, but Microsoft Defender for Cloud is not there for all. Okay, it is not available in the free service. Okay, if you want to work with Microsoft Defender for Cloud, okay, you would need to have one of the subscriptions, okay, and the appropriate license in order to work with it. So this is an important service. Okay, earlier there were lots of services that were enlisted in the security. Uh, you had uh, Azure Sentinel. You had, um, I think. Yeah, Azure Sentinel was there, Microsoft Sentinel. Now the name is Microsoft Sentinel. Okay, all those services were listed and even Microsoft Defender for Cloud has different services like for Endpoint, for 365. Uh, if you, you know, if you want to protect a specific service on Azure, even for IoT, et cetera, there is uh, Microsoft Defender for IoT, for Endpoint, for Cloud, that is there, but this is not the only service that is there. So in terms of security, these are the services that one can look for. So yeah, even Sentinel is a part of the cloud that is there, Microsoft Sentinel. Okay, so it's like something like where you know, like it's like a police, basically, like, you know, once the threat has occurred, okay, once the robbery has occurred, you kind of register a complaint with the police and then the police come and investigate, right? So Microsoft Sentinel is similar to the police, okay? So it will do give you an analysis of the threat uh, that had occurred, how did it occur, on which service did it occur, it will start investigating Okay, and everything is again online on the cloud. 
that is there. But of course, it is not a free listing. It doesn't come with free trial that you have. Again, that also requires a subscription. Okay, these services cost a lot. Okay, so you need to be a part of, you need to be able to purchase the subscription or at least pay for that using the pay as you go model. Okay, that is there. So you can definitely uh, look into that. But it's not a part of AZ900 now. Earlier it was, but now no longer we find this particular service. Okay, but if you do SC900, it is a part of that. So you can study more about that. So with this, we end module two. Module two, we saw the different services. That is compute, networking, storage, identity, access, and security services. So in compute, we have VMs, we have container in services, we have the app service. Then in networking, we have the virtual network, we have the virtual private network, we have Azure Express Route, we have Azure DNS, okay? Then in storage, we saw the different storage services, that is blob, file, queue, and table, okay? And in identity today, we saw that Active Directory or Microsoft Entra ID is the major service for identity and access. It determines your authentication and accessibility or authorization into the Azure environment. OK, and based on that, you can then apply some more services in order to authenticate and authorize yourself. So you can use the MFA, multi-factor authentication, RVAC, rule-based access control in order to determine the authentication and authorization of an individual in the Azure Cloud. And then finally, we did different services in Azure for security, how you can make your cloud secure is one using the zero trust policy. Okay, trust no one. Authenticate, authorize everyone who comes in. You can apply this particular zero trust policy. Okay, the second thing that you can do is apply a defense in depth approach. Okay, which is like a layered architecture where you start from the physical uh, security. Then move on one layer below, and these layers are in work in isolation. So whatever you want to protect should be placed in the layer above. Okay, so if you want to protect compute, that is VMs, container instances, Kubernetes, place the service on the, uh, I mean, the security part on, on top of the other layer, that is the networking layer. And, and then, whichever service you are working in whichever layer, the security goes on top of that layer. Then finally, we saw Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So what is this Defender for Cloud? It is like a, a, a service which talks about your security of your cloud as a whole. Okay, it will give you recommendations, suggestions. It will give you a scorecard, okay, through the secure score, like how, um, uh, well protected is your Azure cloud. So before you uh, kind of you know create any service, deploy any service, you can definitely have a look at your Microsoft Defender for cloud. So let's just one thing. So I'll just show you how the Microsoft. Defender for cloud looks like. Okay, so this is the Microsoft Defender for cloud. Okay, so this is your overview. Currently, this is what it is. I don't have this service, okay, because I have uh, just viewing rights and currently I have nothing over here. So you can see it will give you a secure score over here. And then it will, the number of subscriptions I have, okay, all that thing, it will. List down over here. 
it can give you recommendations if you see you can get recommendations as of now my resource health is unhealthy okay but yeah it can uh, see so you can see it is giving me recommendations then you can see security alerts that are there are there any alerts okay before i kind of uh, i mean the potential threats okay can can give you alerts over here okay then you can go and see your security posture basically the security secure score that is there so you can see two out of six services or resources that i have okay currently is unhealthy i should go and check them okay and then it has given me 14 a score of 14 for a uh, secure score and not just for azure if you're working on aws you have an environment for that you can definitely check your security there also okay so you can see you have different cloud options for that you can even see the governance that you have applied. You can see certain security solutions. If you want recommendations, you can get it over here. So this is how the Microsoft Defender for Cloud looks like. This is the overview tab. So you can see this is the regulatory compliance. And in most cases, I have passed the regulatory. I have complied with the regulatory. OK, so one. As of now, is healthy a breast? Like I said, my services are not healthy enough. I need to check them. Okay, so this is how you can use the Microsoft Defender for cloud. So keywords basically is something like a, a storage kind of service where you can store your passwords, your username, not username, passwords, certificates, okay? And so instead of, you know, directly entering the password or directly and giving the certificate out, okay, you can kind of store it as a secret and give that secret to any of the service, like you're working on Azure Data Factory, you're working on Azure, uh, Azure Data Breaks, you're working in Azure ML service, okay? Uh, yeah, we are coming to tags in the next module, so we will see tags over there. Okay, but coming to key vault, key vault is like a, a secret management service on Azure, so you can handle all your secrets, passwords, certificates, and instead of directly entering those values, it will go via the key vault service of Azure, which where you can just give the uh, you need to have the secret ID and you can just give that and it will automatically associate with the password that you have. So, in, so this is way in a way you can like secure it. OK, so that is what is key vault. Yes. I have no idea of key pairs in AWS, but key vaults is what is this? OK, so tags we are going to see in the next module that we are going to do right now so with this we end module three okay uh what we can do is i'll do some little bit explanation of module three like 15 minutes more and then we'll take a break okay and then i'll continue module three okay and once that is done we will go on to the exam prep session i will give you a 15 minute exam prep and once we complete the exam prep Okay, there is an assessment like Chaitali said, where you can go and attempt uh, some questions of AZ 900. So we are going, I'm going to give you time for doing that. Okay, so this is how we will go ahead with our session now. So let's go and do module three. OK, so now in module three, we are now going to focus on the management and the monitoring aspects on Azure. OK, the, so like I said yesterday, cost is a very important factor. OK, in uh, when you are working with on Azure and you know, in, in general, also cost is a very important factor. 
right so we are going to see certain ways in which you can manage your cost okay like we talked about predictability benefit of cloud yesterday so in case you want to predict how much a resource is going to cost you okay like or for that matter you want to do a migration right you want to migrate from on premise to the azure cloud okay how much cost savings are you going to do okay how much is it going to charge you etc all that comparison if you want to do okay we can do that through the cost management of azure but before we understand how to predict costs how to manage costs okay there are certain factors okay that affect your cost that is there which you need to consider while working with it okay so this let's see the different factors that affect cost in azure so the very first factor is the resource type what kind of a resource are you creating is it a vm is it a database okay is it a storage account what kind of a resource it is because on azure okay not every resource has not all the resource i mean the resources that are there do not cost the same okay they don't but they don't have the same cost you are creating a vm you are creating a storage account their cost is going to be different a vm might charge you less but a storage account will have a high cost so in contrary even the database database servers we know so we need to have a server and then on top of that there is a database okay so the servers that are there okay a database server will cost you a lot as compared to a vm or a storage account then if you are working on databricks azure ml you are working with data factory any of these services okay these services tend to cost a lot okay so because they have their own compute okay you need to configure compute at the back end all that cost is involved so what kind of resource are you creating is going to play a crucial role and it is a factor that will affect the cost like i said all the services on azure do not have the same costs they have different costs so what kind of service are you deploying is going to matter secondly the consumption if you have a pay as you go model and it is like a consumption based model so whatever you have consumed you need to pay for all that things matter for how long are you running your vm okay how long are you um, yeah but you will be charged for the vm bro right how long you will be charged for the vm how long are you running okay whether it will support the sql server or not okay even though if it's free on the vm the vm if it has to support sql server you will need to have a higher disk in order to do that all those things will be con will be a factor okay so when you are working even on a vm and you are installing another software on top of it your disk and hdd does not provide you with that you need to go with an ssd the operating system will be a different one it has to be a uh, better version okay so all those factors also contribute even though if you are creating a vm a vm okay how long are you going to run the vm that is also a important part of consumption if in case you forget to stop the vm then what what will happen then you will be still billed for it right your cost will go up so even the consumption matters okay then if uh, azure is undergoing a maintenance okay and you have a vm i mean you have if you have any of the uh, services that you are running okay like in vm you have not stopped your vm and you've kept it running and azure has decided to go undergo a maintenance okay undergo a firmware update at their data center level okay then this also will cost you so you have to make sure that if you don't that if you have not so at times uh, even though you have shut down the vm for maintenance purposes okay you can be built okay because that vm is undergoing a 
maintenance issue. I mean, there is a maintenance at the data center level. Okay. So this is one factor. These are the this is the third factor. The other factor is geography, the region where you are deploying. So yesterday, if I if you saw, I was deploying in the East US region. Why I was doing that? Though there is a lot of latency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but why I was doing that is because it, the cost in the region for a VM is much cheaper compared to Australia, compared to Central, compared to India regions also. Okay, so which in whichever region or geography you are deploying your service, that also matters. That also affects your cost. Okay. Then the fifth is how much van, what kind of data are you working with? Okay. If it's an ingress data, inbound data, then you will not be charged for it. Okay. But if you're sending anything out from a service, from a resource, Okay, the outbound data or the egress data that is there. Okay, you will be billed for it. Okay, incoming data, no worries, but outgoing data that is there, you will have to pay for it. Okay, so that is the fifth factor that affects the cost. And then lastly is your subscription. What kind of a subscription do you have? Whether it's a free trial, which will not allow you to create multiple services there are restrictions on that okay but depending on what subscription you have you will get your cost will be affected if it's an enterprise level subscription you will be billed higher but if it's an mct like i said i have a restriction of 7000 or 11000 okay you have to you have to manage in that only so like i remember i was working on synapse azure synapse analytics okay i had a batch on that and I remember like I couldn't delete the Synapse environment and the Synapse environment, the serverless pool or the compute behind it generally costs you a lot. Okay, the dedicated pool on an hourly basis also their cost is high. It's around 200, 300 rupees for an hour. Okay, so that also affects so the service and of course the subscription. OK, what kind of a subscription you have also matters when you are working or when you have to do a cost analysis. So whenever you're handling cost, consider these six factors that are there which can affect your cost. So like I said, one of the ways in which I handled the cost is OK, not working in the India region, but working in the East US region, deploying all my services there. Then the second thing is like if I've created a VM, making sure the VM is top. I mean, I don't, the running time of VM is not on. I mean, it's not on 24 7, 365 days. Again, that is depending on your need. Again, okay, it doesn't, uh, for me, I don't need to keep the VM on. I can delete it, I can stop it. Okay, so these are the ways in which you can manage and understand the factors that affect the cost and you know uh, find a way out of it okay you can try and find a way in in order to manage the cost so if you want to predict uh so yesterday we had seen the azure marketplace where i showed you the list of categories that are there okay uh which where you can go and look for different services okay like databases virtual machines, IoT services, Azure services. So that is called as the Azure marketplace. So it's like a card. Okay, it's like you go shopping and look for uh, different services that are there in Azure. So that is what is the marketplace. Now, let's say you want to predict the cost. You want to find out how much are you going, how much is it going to charge you Okay, if you are going to create a particular service. Okay, so if I want to. Yes, so if you stop the VM, your consumption charges will go away. Okay, but since your VM is deployed on top of a, is present at a data center, so the storage cost will be there. The operational cost will not be there. Yeah, so whatever, so the VM that is wherever it is stored, like in the East US region, 
the storage cost will be there, but the running or the consumption of the VM, the hourly basis yesterday that we saw, will no longer be charged to you. Just for the storage, you will be uh, charged. Okay, so if I want to determine all of this, okay, so like even if you have stopped the VM, how much you, or etc., that you will be, you know, if you want to find out how how much uh, how much is it going to cost you in which region if I deploy, how much it will cost me, etc. If I want to find these things, I want to predict the cost before I deploy the service. I can do that using the Azure pricing calculator. So what is this pricing calculator? It is like a calculator that helps you calculate the cost. OK, by entering basic configurations, like I said, how long do you want to run the VM? What type of disk are you using? What type of operating system are you using? In which region are you going to create this VM? All these configurations, it will take into picture and it will give you the cost. OK, so let's go ahead and see how to create, how to use the pricing calculator that is there. So I will share this link in the chat box. You all can go and use it. You all can try it out. OK. So. So if you go to just type in Azure pricing calculator. And if you go to this link, I will share this link with you in the chat box. So here you can see the different services that have been listed. OK, you can come here and you can select whichever service you want. OK, so like virtual machine so let's go ahead and create a virtual machine let's see if i put in these details so let's say i keep east us as the region let's keep windows you have the option of linux also so let's say you have a standard tier you can go with a basic tier also then let's keep it os you can have a sql server also if you have deployed okay you're creating a sql server okay that also can come in then category, what kind of category, what kind of uh, CPUs do you want? OK, do, do they have to be general purpose or do they have to be high performance or memory optimized, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? You can put that category as well. OK, then what kind of a series of disk that you want? OK, there are different types of disk that are there. You have D series, you have A series, you have B series, you have E series. OK, all of that is there. Even if I think yeah, you can see the series that are there. OK, so you can just filter that out depending on what you require. And then you can come here and. Decide how many cores, what kind of RAM memory are you going to require? OK, or you can do that over here. So what kind of a. Uh, how many cores vCPUs are you going to require? How many member? How much memory are you going to require? Okay, all that you can get information over here. Now this is about one VM. Let's say you want, you know, to create multiple VMs of the same configuration. So you can just enter the value over here. Let's say you want three VMs. Okay, and how long are they going to run? So normally, you know, when a training comes to us and we have to give labs to our clients. OK, so we calculate. So we generally give it on a virtual machine because many companies, you know, have this policy not to install third party softwares and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So what we do is we create kind of a VM. OK, and we estimate all of this by coming into the pricing calculator itself. So we decide, OK, there are 10 participants, so I want 10 instances of the machine. So we come here, put in 10, and now how long is the training going to run? OK, so normally on a, uh, a one day training is of eight hours, correct? So eight hours multiplied by, let's say, it is going to go for four days. So it will be what eight into uh, 
these many days. So for 32 hours, your VM is going to be running. What if somebody, you know, forgets to stop the VM? So we need to keep a buffer time for that. So of course, it's not going to be 32 hours. It's definitely multiplied by, by the number of instances that we have. Okay, so we need to multiply that many hours. Okay, and feed in the information over here. Okay, so if we have to do that calculation, we come here and we do it. Then other way of reducing the cost. Okay, let's say you are, you feel this is too much. Okay, as of now the cost that you are getting. So I will just make it to INR. Okay, you feel okay, this is too much. Okay, so you can even reduce the cost. Let's say uh, you don't want to use the VMs now. Okay, you want to probably within a year or within three years, you're, you want to use this VM. Okay, so you can have two saving plans. That is, uh, you can save this, store this and keep it. Okay, or you can reserve it and keep it. So if you reserve it and keep it, let's say for a year, so you get kind of 40% discount. Okay, if you save it, for a year, you get 13% discount, but if you save it or reserve it, you can see you get this discount. So if you say I want to reserve it for a year, okay, so you can just go with this compute payment option. You can go with option also. So definitely you will be under So here you can see now drastically I have been given a discount of 40%. Okay, so on an average, my monthly cost. If I go for, uh, there is no upfront cost as of now, okay? But if I go for upfront, okay? So you can see this is my total. If I don't pay now, if I pay later, so this will be the cost that will be there. Okay, so you can come here and you can do the assessment. Then if you have a hybrid license, like I said, you have some servers on your on-premise and you are creating some instances on the public cloud. So for that, you need a hybrid license. So if you have that hybrid license, you can definitely put that. OK, and you can see the cost has drastically come down. So these are ways in which you can reduce the cost. And if you want to do an estimation of that cost, you can come to the pricing calculator. So I'll share this link with you all in the chat. So per hour, you will have to uh, just put in the number of hours and then you will have to calculate. You can change from the, uh, only hours, like one hour you will have to specify. But for one hour, generally nobody comes and calculates the cost. Okay. But if you have it for a longer time, then definitely come and use the pricing calculator. Now, moving ahead. So this was about a service, OK? Uh, that you can, before deploying your particular resource or a particular service, you can uh, come and check for that cost using the pricing calculator. We have seen how to use it. Now, let's say you want to migrate your service, I mean, your resources from on premise cloud to the Azure uh, cloud. If you want to do that migration and you want to see how much savings are you going to do? How much are you going to save? Okay, if you keep continuing on the on-premise, but if once you migrate, how much cost are you going to save or how much money are you going to save if you want to do a comparison between the cost, like for five years, if you keep on working on the on-premise side of the cloud, have a private cloud, you know, work on a private cloud, how much cost are you going are you you know how much are you spending compared to if you move to azure what is the cost that you are going to incur if you want to see that comparison 
we can use something called as a total cost of ownership or the TOC calculator. So it's like a report that is created for you. You say, okay, I have these many servers, I have these many databases, I have these many workloads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You put that into the TCO, and it will then generate a report. Okay, out of that, and it will do a comparison. It will say, okay, you have these many servers, these many databases on the on-premise cloud, on the private cloud. Okay, but if you migrate these services to the Azure cloud, this is how much you will be paying. Okay, it will show you the difference and not just for one year, but like it will give you an estimation for the next five years. Like if you migrate to the Azure cloud, how much money are you going to save compared to the on-premise cloud? So if you want to do this, you want to have an estimation for this, you can use the TOC calculator. So let's go ahead and see how to use the TOC. So I will just open it and show it to you all. The link I will share in the chat box. OK, so this is where you can define your workspaces. I mean, your workloads, that is how many servers do you have? So just as of now, I'm just going to go with the default configurations that are there. Then how many databases do you have? OK, I'm just going to go with a basic configuration again over here. And then how many if you have any storage? What kind of a networking? How much bandwidth are you spending on sending out the data from your on premise environment? How much consumption of the data is being done? OK, how much bandwidth do you have? Which region are you in? So if I say East US. OK, they don't have East US, so we can just go with yeah, the East US. OK, and I can now just say next. So what it will do is it, it will generate a report. OK, so here it will now ask you are they GRS or etc, cetera, etc cetera, things. It will ask you how much electricity are you paying? It will ask all those things to you. OK, all that will be asked over here. How much are you paying for the maintenance team? Like it's an on premise cloud, right? So you are maintaining for the labor. You're paying the labor. So how much are you paying them? OK, all that cost is uh, it is asking you over here. How much is your electricity bill? OK, every detail is now being asked over here. So if you say I'll just make this to INR. OK, so all that is being asked over here. OK. So if you now say next. Now it will give you a thorough report that if you move to Azure, OK, you will be saving this much money. OK, you will be saving around 250 million. And this is the graph. It will give you a visual. Also, like it was telling you, OK, this is your cost as of now. But if you move to Azure over five years, you will see this much cost. It will say, OK, for compute, you will be saving this much for the team. You will be saving this much. It is giving you a thorough breakdown also. Of everything, so data center cost is as good as zero. If you see over here, OK, no electricity cost, nothing. I mean, just a little bit you will need to pay for the labor. So you can see you're getting a thorough analysis and you can even download this report, uh, save this report, share this report with your teammates, with your uh, manager. OK, if he has tasked you to find out do an analysis, you can definitely come here and do that. OK, so this is how you can do a total cost of ownership analysis. OK, in case you are looking for migration to Microsoft Azure from your private cloud. 
So I'll share this link as well in the chat box. Now, finally, in terms of course, once you have deployed the service, you have created the service, you have done the predictability, etc., and still you have gone ahead and you have created the service. OK, you still need to have a further understanding of the cost, right? Where have you lost a lot of money or you want to see the bill? You want to see the invoice? OK, you want to set a budget. Like, please, this is the limit up to which I can spend. Or you want to see the or you want to see how much is your budget currently, how much money is left to in your subscription. If you want to do that analysis, you can come to the cost management service on Azure. Okay, so this service will is after you deploy so resources or services on the Azure cloud. Okay, how you can make your cost better. Okay, it's after you have deployed. Definitely, so it will give you alerts, recommendations, OK, where you can save cost even after you have deployed and you can change the re regions, etc. OK, it will give you a report. OK, how much money is left? It will uh, kind of give you a analysis of that. So if I have to do that on my cloud, OK, I'll just go back to my portal. And again, Go to my subscription. So if you go to your subscription. So here you have this service. If you see here you have this service called as cost management, which will give you the analysis of your cost based on the subscription. OK, so here you can see my actual cost is this much. OK, where I am spending money. OK, according to the location, so you can see East US is the place where I normally deploy my services. Then the different resource groups, how much are they, you know, uh, deducting are getting deducted from my cost okay which service has the highest cost so ml is the highest okay that is there it is giving me a uh, analysis of that you can get alerts okay that your billing cycle is coming to an end currently i had i don't have that okay i have a lot of money around i think 6000 is still there if i have to see i can see that in the cost analysis you can even set a budget OK, you can add a budget. OK, over here for like, OK, this is my budget. How much? Uh, OK, how much limit have I reached? You know, currently I have no budget, but you can come here and you can add. OK, this much is my budget only when you know, please consider this much. And once I, re you know, have overgone my budget, please give me an alert. OK, so that you don't spend up and uh, spend up money, you know, end up spending a lot of money on the on a specific service that is there. Then of course you can get recommendations where you can make your cost better. As of now it has no recommendation for me. OK, so you can once you have that, you can download it as a CSV file, download it as a PDF and you can work on those recommendations and you can improve the cost. So as of now, if I have a notification, this much money is remaining. So it gives me an alert every time I log into my account. OK, so this is the thorough report that it gives me. I can download this report OK, and see where I am spending in which month I have spent it. Though I have, uh, you know, I have um, used up my cost. I have utilized most of my money. OK. All that is provided down over here. OK, so this is how you can do a cost analysis, manage your cost on Azure. So I think in terms of cost, we have completed. Yeah, one more important thing that is there. 
we'll just complete that and then we'll go for the break. coming to the tags okay so tags is something that is like a metadata for a resource that you have created so normally when we go shopping where we can't see a salesperson and we want to find out what is the cost of this item right what is the size of this item in terms of clothing or etc if you want to know more about that particular item you have a tag associated with it right which will give you all that description, okay? From where is it manufactured? What is the size? What is the cost, etc. So similarly, if I want to do that to a service or a resource that I have created in Azure, I can do that in using the tags. So let's say I have a VM created. For what purpose have I created this VM? For which organization? For which department within that organization? I have created this VM. If I want to keep that information stored, okay, we use the tags. So tags is like a name value pair. It's like a taxonomical approach that you give to your uh, services or resources that you have created. So that, you know, when you are, you have to pay for that service, you come to know, okay, it all, this VM I had created for marketing department. Okay, and the purpose was for this, this, this. Okay, similarly, if you have created an app service or a website, you have deployed it onto Azure environment. Okay, for whom is this website that you had created or etc. done testing or if you want to elaborate on it, you go with the tags. So tags are nothing but some short description that you can give to your resources so that you can, you know, <clears throat> logically put them okay for this service for for this purpose i had created and even during billing okay it will help you like to pinpoint okay this is where for this purpose for this thing i had created this thing and that is why i have been billed for it okay so this is a way in which you can organize your resources in a much better way. And for that, you have tags. OK, so with this, we end the cost analysis, cost management of Azure. Now we are going to focus on governance and compliance. And finally, we are going to look at some of the monitoring tools and management tools in Azure, different ways of accessing Azure and monitoring your services on Azure. So let's take a 20 minute break. OK, we'll take a 20 minute break. Uh, after the break, we will. Resume our session, so it's around uh, 350. OK, uh, let's take a break and we'll resume at 410. OK.
uh, guys, as we are on break, meanwhile, get your batch activated for AZ 900. I have shared the steps and the link in the chat box for you all. Uh, those who have yet to get the batch activated, make sure you follow the steps and get the batch activated. Uh, this uh, batch includes all the study material related to the certification AZ 900. And any of you uh, facing problem while the redemption of the badge, do let me know in the chat box. Me and my team is there to help okay. you out.
Guys, uh, those who are done with the patch, please put done on our chat box.
Hello everyone. Let's get started. So now we will be talking about the governance aspect. Okay, like I said, governance and compliance is going to be an important factor when we talk about working with data in Azure. So there are certain services that one can use when they are talking about governance and adhering to the rules, regulations, policies of a region. So the very first service is called as the Azure Blueprint. Now, what is the Azure Blueprint? So normally uh, when we have to do the interiors of a house, right? Uh, in that, uh, like we hire a interior designer. And the first thing that the interior designer asks you is give me the plan of the house, right? He will ask you, let me know how many bedrooms does your room, does your house have? How, where is the kitchen? How big are the bedrooms? Okay, what uh, do you have any balcony or not, etc. So what does he do? He will ask you for that plan. So what is that plan? That plan is a blueprint or a structure which will help the interior designer understand, okay, this is an empty wall. I should place the cupboards here. I should make the cupboards this side. The bed should be this way. The bed should be this big or this wide. Okay. All that he can design based on the plan that you give him. So let's say I want to do that same thing on Azure. I have a developer. Okay. And I want the developer to follow a certain structure of certain plan. Okay, like, okay, I want these roles to be assigned. These are the number of people who I need to, I want you to assign. Okay, I want these many resource groups in my Azure cloud. I want these services to be deployed. I want uh, these many, uh, res I mean, these are the list of things that I want you to do that. And I want you to do them quickly. So what does the developer do? Okay, he gets that plan and he starts working on it one by one. So that plan in Azure is called as a Azure Blueprint. So this blueprint that is there, it helps them, you know, build and deploy certain environments very quickly so that if you know uh, within the organization there's no delay they know what they are doing and you know otherwise what would happen they would have to normally ask the manager ask the superior person okay the person above him and then they would need to deploy so if they have a ready-made plan it becomes much easy and much faster for the developer to develop the certain things so at which region should I deploy the resource groups? What kind of resources are required, etc. All these things, if I put it into a plan and I give it to the developer, that is called as a as your blueprint. The other service that you can use when you are talking about governance and compliance is called as the Azure policy. So what is the Azure policy? So like in organizations, we have certain uh, policies like we can't, we have to wear formal clothes only on Friday, you're allowed to wear casuals, right? You can't smoke in the office premises. There is a smoking area for it. You have to log in and log out at this time. So this, the, these are what, these are the certain policies of that organization. Same thing if I want to apply on a resource or a resource group. Okay, or on a subscription or on a management group, I can use something called as Azure policy. So what is this Azure policy? It is like a definition that you give. Like for example, you don't want to deploy any resource, let's say in the Japan region. You don't have an you don't have any customers over there. So why waste money in and deploy over there to make it global? Instead, focus on the region which is generating revenue for you. So what you can do is you can just put a policy that whoever is working in your organization or on the Azure cloud, okay, there will be a restriction 
of deploying any service in the Japan region. So that restriction, if I have to create, I can create it using the Azure policy. Okay, so the Azure policy is a way to enforce certain compliance policies, regulations, like how you can restrict it to a region. Okay, you can restrict uh, multiple things and you can put them in the policy. Okay, so that is what a policy does. So, of course, not just in terms of region, but there are multiple policies which are being predefined in Azure. Earlier, there was a lab on this, but now they have scrapped it. So if you want to know more about the governance policies, I think you can go online and you can search. OK, so which policy is applicable to you? The Azure policy, you can definitely use that on your subscription or on the resource group level. You can apply it. The next thing that you can do in order to protect your resources or your resource group is apply something called as a resource lock. Now, what is a resource lock? So let's say, you know, we are humans and we will tend to make mistakes. We do tend to make, right? So at times what can happen is you have accidentally deleted a resource group or you have modified in some service within the resource group. OK, so what will happen? It will cause a problem. You have lost all your work, right? You will have to redo the work. You don't remember once you have lost the work. You don't recall those things that you have done. It takes time. You lose out on the uh, production. You lose out on the efficiency. So if you want to avoid the accidental delete or updation of your resource group, you can use something called as a resource lock. So what is this lock, this lock is of two types. One is cannot delete and the other is read only. So cannot delete, as the name says, you can't delete the resource group, but you can update it, definitely change it, read it, all those things you can do, but you can't delete it. The other lock is the read only lock, which says that you can only read, okay? You can't update or delete it. So let's go ahead and see how to apply a resource lock to any of the resource groups that you have. So we have a resource group created, correct? Yesterday we had seen how to create. So let's see how to apply a lock on top of that. So I'm sharing my screen. And I'm going to go to the resource group. I have this resource group that I had created. So if you scroll down on the left in the settings, you have the locks property. So just click on it. Say add. Give it a name. So I'm going to say cannot delete because I don't want this resource group to be deleted. So instead of read only, you can go with only delete. Let's say I want to modify this thing which I can't do it if I apply a read only lock, but in a delete lock, I can modify this resource group. I can add other resources, other services. I can do that. And once this is done, click on OK. And now you will see a lock created. So if you go to the overview and now say delete resource group. Give it a name, say delete. Can you see you're getting a message that this resource group is locked and it cannot be deleted. So you can apply a lock to the resource group that is there in case you want to protect your resource group from being resource group to be protected from being deleted or updated, you can definitely do that through the locks. Now coming to the compliance, like I said, we have to 
So you apply locks only to the resource group. You can apply locks only to the resource group. There is no lock, or you can apply specifically to a service, but uh, there is a child lock that you can apply, which is in by default, it is then inherited. So if you apply to the resource group or to a specific this thing, then you can also do that to the specific service. So if you apply it to a VM, yes, then it will only be. Um, so read only updates because you're not going to do any updates, so there will be no logs. Definitely there will be a log of the this thing. So you, once you have created the VM and you can't change any settings, then of course they will not be logged. OK, whatever incoming data, outgoing data, what if the VM is on, OK, and you are kind of working on the VM, yes, then that will be logged in, but it will update meaning in terms of resource group, like adding anything new to that resource group, adding a new resource to the resource group, all that means updated. It's not pertaining to the service. So your lock is not applied to the service if you apply it to the resource group. Okay, rest everything will work inside that particular service or the resource that you have created. Now coming to the compliance. Okay, so like I said, when we create uh, or we are sharing data okay, across regions. So we know that data has become very critical and across regions, we need to adhere to certain government policies, government regulations okay, in order to protect our data. So in whichever region you deploy your service, it has to adhere to that particular region or particular or adhere to that particular standard. So if I want to know more about the standards, OK, we have a service trust portal which is created by Microsoft, which enlists the standards. It considers the various standards of different regions, OK, like GDPR, that is the general data protection regulation, which is a popular standard in the European region. OK, the ISO, which is a part of the United States region. OK, or you can see here according to the region, according to the industry, whatever standards are there, regulations that one has to consider, has to comply with, OK, is listed down in the service trust portal. OK, so this portal will tell you, OK, these are the standards. If you see here, these are the standards in terms of healthcare and life services which are included in these services. You can see Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365 and Azure. They have already been included and this, these are the standards that Azure is complying with, out of which I think HIPAA is the most popular. Yeah, HIPAA, if you see, it is a health insurance backed protection. I don't remember the full form. OK, but it is a popular standard in terms of health. OK, so this is a industry standard you have pertaining to the region. So this is a GDPR regulation. OK, so you can see it is mostly for European EU residents. If, if you see, so these are applied on which which service in Azure. You can see that listed down over here in the service trust portal. OK, so if I want to understand that compliance, OK, you can come to this service trust portal and you can look at those compliance regulations, policies, OK, according to the region, according to the industry, according to uh, organization need. OK, if you scroll down according to what your organization requires, you can come and see that. OK, so this is about the regulatory standards that or the compliance policies. So like if you want to catalog your data um, or you want to uh, do data discovery or do 
um, you know, organize your data catalog is what I said. Microsoft has its own uh, service called as Microsoft Purview. Earlier, it was called as Azure Purview. It's not a part of AZ900, but for information, because that service is now getting, is get, you know, is becoming popular. Uh, organizations, when you're talking about enterprise level, so governing your data within the organization, complying with the data that your organization has, you know, set up standards. So when I say according to your standards in the organization, so you can create that, that particular compliance, those data governing rules, you can create it in the Azure uh, sorry, in the Microsoft Purview portal. So that is a compliance service, uh, a proprietary Microsoft compliance service that it offers. But in terms of uh, region-wise or in terms of industry-wise, if you want to see in which particular service, what standard is being used uh, and it is being com complied with, you can come in the Service Trust portal and you can see that. Okay, so I'll share this link as well in the chat box for you all to explore. So this was about the governance uh, policies that you can use. Okay, some government uh, standards, we already talked about the sovereign regions. If you all recall yesterday, where I said some special regions, uh, regions have their special standards, all of that you can go and see in the service trust portal. So this is what we saw right now. Okay. Now coming to the management and the monitoring tools, how you can access the Azure um, yeah, that I don't know, but you can see in the link that I have shared. Okay, uh, I'm not aware of the date. I just know ISO, HIPAA, GDPR, which are the popular standards. Rest, if you want to see if it's a part of some region or part of some uh, stand or, or industry, you can just go ahead and see from the link that I have shared. Now, coming to the management and monitoring aspect. So we saw that since yesterday, we have been using the Azure portal to access the Azure cloud. So apart from the portal, okay, we have uh, other services as well. And those are the command line interfaces. So there are two command line interfaces. That is the PowerShell. And second is the Azure CLI. Okay, this is what these are the two ways in which you can access the Azure cloud. Okay, if you don't want to use the portal, and these two Azure, this that is PowerShell and CLI is easy to download from the Microsoft Store. You can download it onto your system. Okay, but let's say you don't want to download it onto your system. You can use something called as the cloud shell, and this cloud shell is available on the Azure portal, okay? Uh, so it helps you navigate between the CLI and the PowerShell. I will show uh, about the Cloud Shell in some time, okay? Then uh, now coming to the difference between PowerShell and CLI, this is a very important question that is asked in the exam in AZ-900 certification. And I remember even on, even I had got it uh, when I gave the exam is, let's say if they will put a scenario across to you. They will say, I have this, this, this. I have a Windows operating system. Or let's say I have a Linux operating system, not a Windows operating system. And on top of that, I want to use my Azure services Okay, access my Azure services through the Azure PowerShell command line tool. Okay, so they will then ask you yes or no. So the answer to this is going to be always no. And why is that? Because PowerShell that is there, it only and only works on Windows operating system. Keep that in mind. It is a service or a command line tool 
that is available only if you have the Windows operating system. Otherwise, this particular service is not available to you. So if you have a Linux or a Mac OS, this particular service is not available. On the contrary, Azure CLI uses something called as bash, bash script, okay? This particular command line tool is available on all the operating systems that is Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So you can use either of the two, but keep in mind PowerShell is only available on the Windows operating system. Otherwise, it is not available to people using Linux or Mac OS. Clear? So this is the difference and it's an important difference. So they'll put a big scenario, a big confusing question will come and then they will ask, does this solution match to the uh, uh, to your problem? And if they will ask you yes or no, so please be careful and read the question there carefully and then answer. Then now coming like we know how to access Azure Cloud. OK, we saw how to create resources. We saw how to deploy resources, but do you know who actually is responsible behind it? It is the Azure resource manager. So though you are accessing from either of the command line tools or from the Azure portal, the one who is actually fetching the resource for you, helping you create, helping you delete, helping you update, okay, managing those resources is nothing but the resource manager or arm short form is arm okay so once you have authenticated yourself and you you have the authorization to create resources okay depending on the role that you have you can get those resources create those resources from the azure resource manager so this is the person who is responsible this is the service sorry that is responsible to provide the create creation, deletion, updation of your services in, as in your Azure subscription on your Azure cloud. Okay, now let's say you have multiple VMs to create. We saw manually how to create a VM, right? Let's say I want to create multiple VMs using the same configuration. Okay, so yesterday we saw that we, I was going and manually I was entering the values, giving it a name, giving it uh, credentials, deciding the ports to allow, okay, managing the disk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, let's say I, I want to do that for multiple VMs, the same configuration, just the VM name is going to change, okay, just it is going to become VM1 to VM2, okay, I have to do that so many times do the same things manually so many times. So instead of going and doing it manually, Azure has made it easy for you by providing again a template called as the ARM template, the Azure Resource Manager templates. So what are these templates? They are like files, JSON files, that is the JavaScript object notation files, okay, which you can, if you know how to configure, okay, it's like a key value pair. Okay, so wherever it is asking you for VM name, only that you have to change. And once you have you have a standard format for the other configurations, you just have to copy that, paste it, just change the name, and automatically you can create VMs in that manner. So instead of manually doing the task 10 times, you're just copy pasting and just changing the name. Rest all the things remain the same, the disk, the operating system, the inbound ports that you want to allow, the username, password to those VMs remain the same. So if I want to do that, I can use the ARM um, templates or the Azure Resource Manager templates. So they are like JSON files. So you just need to know how to write, or, I mean, work with JSON files, uh, and then you are good to go and create how many VMs you want to create. Clear? So it's like a template that it will provide you. Even the region you can configure everything, you can do that using this particular template. And not just for VM, you get a template for databases, you get a template for any number of services that you want to create. 
okay, in the form of a JSON file, and you can go ahead and configure them. So for that, you can use the ARM templates. So this was about the management, how you can manage your resources on Azure, okay, deploy certain resources using the ARM templates instead of doing it through the portal. Okay, you can download the template, though you'll have to work on the uh, portal for it. Okay, um, and then you can go ahead and manage it. And then coming to the last part of the module three is monitoring tools. When you have, once you have created that particular resource or service, you want to monitor it. You want to see how well it is doing. Okay, you want to get recommendations. You want suggestions for improvement. Okay, you want to see how is the service? How is the health of the service? Okay, all that information is come can come from the monitoring tools of Azure. So the very first tool is the Azure monitor. So these services that I'm listing down are specific to the resource so once you create the resource these services will you can see otherwise you will not be able to see it okay because they are a part of that particular resource or service that you have created on azure so azure so first is actually sorry azure advisor so as the name says advisor its job is to advise you give you recommendations suggestions where you can optimize your performance optimize your security okay ensure that you have no threat, okay, secure your service, okay, all that things, if it has to list down, check your availability, how how highly available is your, is this service, okay, all that is listed down in the Azure advisor, okay, so it will give you recommendations, okay, based uh, on what is best for that particular Azure service. Then the next service is the Azure Service Health. It will help you determine <laughs> the health of your service, how good it is, how well it is doing. Is it going to be available? Okay, what is um, the how well it is going to perform is it going under maintenance is it going to be uh is it facing some problem okay any health problem okay in terms of how good it is working okay it will give you a elaborate view of that okay so that you can decide how can you improve the health do you want to use this service or not in the future you can determine that using the Azure service help. Then the final service that you can use, and this, I think this is the most important service, is the Azure monitor. So if you want to monitor your service, monitor, watch the telemetry, okay, do a, get an insight of your application or of your service, okay, uh, you can do that using the Azure monitor. So if you want to see where the error occurred, at what point the error occurred, get alerts, okay, in the form of a dashboard kind of a thing, you can do that using the Azure monitor. So let me show you, we have a storage account created, correct, from yesterday. Let's, and let's see where you can view all these services on Azure. So I'll navigate to my this thing. So if you go to the overview section, and if you scroll down, you have this monitoring. So this monitoring is nothing but your Azure monitor, okay, which will give you the information about how much data have you ingested, how much data have you, how much outbound data have you, you know, uh, how much data has been outbound? Okay, what is the latency that you experienced? Okay, was there any breakdown during the transition? I mean, during the uploading of your data? Okay, all that is provided in the Azure monitoring service over here. You can even get uh, for something else like for blogs specifically. Also, you can see 
So since we don't have files or anything, I will not get much data about that. So here you can see there were a total of 79 success. Okay, and only a 8% chance of error. Okay, all that monitoring you can do for blobs or for or something specific in your storage account. This you can't, this is not required. Then recommendation as your recommendation. As of now, I am uh, my service at my Azure has no recommendation for me. It thinks I am my service that I have deployed is optimized to the fullest. OK, if required, it will give me recommendations. I can see those recommendations over here. And in terms of health. Yeah, so can you see you have this resource health? OK, it will give you a thorough analysis about your health, about the resource health. How good it is, how bad it is. Is it is there any issue that it is facing? OK, so this is where you can add even an alert in case it you want an alert. OK, the service is kind of going down. There is some uh, problem with the service. OK, uh, it will give that alert, but you need to create that alert. OK, you can even diagnose those problems using this feature. OK, so here you can come and see the health of your resource that is then. So these are some of the monitoring tools specific to the resource level, to the service level that is there in Azure. So with this, we bring an end to the three modules to the AZ900 training. Now let's go ahead. Yeah, you will get no alerts once you. Yeah, you it will get you will get the alerts in your mail. So if you have used your personal ID in order to create the active directory, OK, on your Azure account, I mean the Azure account. So you will get a notification over there. Like I also get notifications in terms of my subscription coming to an end or something like that. Like, you know, the bill, new billing cycle, etc. All that alerts, you will get it to your email. There will be no SMS, but it will go to your email. There will be an alert for that. So you can create that as well. Now coming to the exam prep. OK, let's look at how you can prepare for the exam. So I'm going to go and share. I'm going to show from where you can schedule the exam. OK, uh, from where can you study whatever we have seen as of now? OK, from where which site can you do that? OK, just one minute. OK, so I'm sharing my screen for it. So Microsoft has a website called as learn.microsoft.com where you can get all the study material for, uh, for any role that you're looking for. Okay, whether it's AI or data or administrator, etc., you can come here and you can search for it. Okay, so if you go to the credential options, you can browse for credentials. So if you see on the left hand side, these are the services that are there. Okay, product wise, so Azure, you can see these are the services or the documentation for the services that are there. But if you're looking for a role specific, you can come to the roles and you can see the services over here. You can even create custom paths for yourself. So if you come to the training and come to career paths, so you get a entire this thing. So if you want to become an AI engineer, so it will list down the collection for you. But I think I will have to sign in in order to see that. OK, this is fine. So what you can do is you can just go onto these learning paths, learn from here. OK. Uh, create a self paced learning path for yourself. OK, using the uh, training. Career path. OK, and going to the browse collection. 
okay uh, you decide which path you want to do and you will get a list of learning paths which you can go study so if you click on this you will get the documentation for that particular module that is there and you can study it at your own pace okay then what kind of a certification is required if you want to be an ai engineer ai developer that also is listed down so these are the basic modules that you need to cover and this is the advanced advanced module sorry that is there that you can do once you complete these modules so you can customize paths okay for your for any role that you want to pick that you want to get certified on okay you can even go for administrator so administrator these are the things so you can just see so you can see the pre prerequisites okay that are there and if you want to be an administrator this is the instructor led training and this is a self paced training that you can take on your own okay so you can come here and you can browse for these paths you can browse for certifications which were earlier called certifications now they are called as credentials okay so you can come and search for a specific credential so since we have done az900 so i'm going to go ahead and search for az900 and uh, just a minute i'll be back yeah so now if you want to give the az900 certification so you can browse to this credentials i will post this link in the chat okay once i am done explaining about it okay and you can come and get information about whatever we have done so this exam guys is going to be updated okay though that information is also put in over here so whatever we have done today is not the updated version okay so you if you in case in the future give the exam after 23rd of january make sure you come here and see the updates that are there okay so everything is listed down over here okay so you have a study guide all the updates are put in over here as well you have a exam sandbox if you want to know how the environment exam environment looks like you can come and you can see it in the exam sandbox that is there okay and if you think you are ready you have studied okay you can come and schedule the exam over here okay there are two ways in which you can schedule one is the pearson view and the other is the sorti pot okay so you can either give the exam from your home or you can give the exam by going at the uh, center okay examination center so pearson view or so and sorti pot have a list of uh, centers so you can find out the center that is nearby your house in case you don't want to give this exam from your, the comfort of your house okay why because at times you know when you are giving it from your house you have to be very careful uh, so that nobody is there in the room a because microsoft does not allow a second person to be inside the room and your room needs to be clean you can't have any books lying around you can't have your phone lying around you can't even wear your watch or digital watch or even if it's a analog watch you're not allowed to wear okay so it has a lot of restrictions in that terms so if you don't want to do that you can definitely go to the center and give the exam okay so this is the cost of the exam that you would need to pay if you want to give it in the future this is the inr cost okay but if you purchase 
the exam so we uh, since we are microsoft gold partners so we can provide you with exam vouchers but you will have to purchase it uh, you will get around discount of 25% okay so if you are paying 3696 you if you purchase a voucher from us you will get around 25% discount which is still a lot guys trust me uh, so in case you want to give exam AZ-900 or any other certification, not just AZ-900, any advanced role-based certification also or export level certification also, you can purchase the exam voucher from us at a discounted rate of 25%. Okay. So this is where you can come and you can schedule the exam. So if you scroll below, this is what we have done today and these are the percentages of the or the weightage of uh, questions coming from each section okay so around for the first module it is 25 to 30 percent mostly all of them are around 30 30 percent okay uh, you can just do that math and you can see and the second module is the most important module then you can where can you come and study? You can see there are two ways in which you can prepare. One is the self-paced and the other is instructor-led. Okay, so these are the modules. So the presentations that I made was not from here itself. So you can come here and you can study the study for AZ-900. Okay, so this is where you can come and schedule the exam. Now, in terms of the exam, uh, the uh, passing is 700 out of 1000. So you need to get 70%, okay, in order to get AZ 900 certification. There is no negative marking. You, uh, there is there is no labs that you need to perform, okay. The questions that will come. So let's move on to the sample questions that I have. So the up updates, even I don't know. OK, you will have to come on 23rd and see. It's just next week, so you will have to come and see. I have no idea what updates they are going to do. OK, so you'll have to go and see. And um, yeah, you will get a receipt. So you can contact Chaitali or Archie. OK, you can get uh, contact, call us on our mobile number. We have, we have shared that in the chat box. So you can definitely uh, go and call us. OK, so my team will revert on it and you will get an exam voucher for the same. OK, uh, coming to the sample questions for AZ 900. I'll just show the sample questions. OK. Uh, like how, what kind of questions come? I will just glance through them for you all. So these are the kind of questions that can come. Okay, you can get, uh, yes, the exam will be valid after 23rd. Definitely, it's just, it's going to go, some updates are going to come in. OK, I don't know what the updates are going to come in. You will have to come to this site and you will have to see. OK, um, just make sure you do that. OK, you, there was a study guide link that I, that was there. You can go there and you can see the updates uh, that also I will share in the chat box. OK. Uh, but what kind of updates will come? I can't tell you that. OK. Um, also now coming back to the questions, these are the kind of questions. So you can get questions where you have to say yes and no. OK, match the following, complete the or fill in the lines. OK, at times there can be questions where you have to mark two or three options. OK, it's not just one option is the answer. You have to mark two or three quest answers to it, that question. OK, then you can get scenario based questions. This is the answer to the first question. Something like this, like I said, match the following. OK, you can get. Then you can get a scenario and they will ask you for the appropriate solution. OK, so database is a pass service on Azure and VM is a IAS service. OK, so whatever is appropriate, you can 
uh, I mean, I don't know what is okay. The question is this. So you can check for the answer. This is how it is there. Then you can get a simple, straightforward question. Okay. And which will have only one answer to it. So this is the answer. Then, like I said, a question can have more than one answer at times. So you need to select two options out of them. So this is the answer. So you please be careful while you're reading the questions. Then you can get a scenario based question and this is very popular. They will give you a scenario. They will give you a solution and they will ask, is this matching to your solution or not? OK, so some like, something like this. I don't know if I have it. Yeah, something like this. So you will get uh, something like this where they will give you a solution and a problem and you have to say yes or no. OK, so a scenario based. These are very popular questions that come. Then again, match the following. Kind of questions. Then fill in the blanks. Based on simple definitions like what is as your region? What is as your monitor? What is as your functions or etc? Where would you use functions? So like I said, for serverless computing and rigor based situations like that, they will ask you questions. So it's going to be it's easy. OK, very easy questions. Something like this. So it's going to be the same. Okay, just you need to study. Okay, then I told you how to schedule. So this is how you can prepare for the exam. And the questions that you all saw here are actual questions. Okay, so as of now, today we are going to give you a practice, free practice assessment. But in case in the future you feel, okay, that I need more practice. Okay, I want to... Uh, practice on more questions related to the AZ 900 certification, you can come to a website. I'll just share my screen about it. You can come to a website called as uh, exam topics. So this is a very popular exam. Uh, I mean, popular site for practicing something called as exam dumps. OK, mm -hmm. they have the latest questions on any. So exam that you wish to give in the future, it's not just Microsoft. They even have for AWS GCP. OK, so you can come here in the popular exams and you can see that they have multiple exam dumps for different different uh, exams that are there. So if you go to Microsoft, you can see all the exam dumps for the certifications that you're looking for. Just search that certification. So here, if you go, you have AZ 900 and they have around 458 questions in their database. OK, and they are actual questions that come in the exam. OK, so whenever I also prepare, I first of all do the learn modules definitely. I study the learn modules, understand that. And then once I am done, I come here and practice the questions, test my knowledge. OK, so this is a site you can come and you can practice. So with this, I bring an end even to the exam preparation. OK, in case you feel like how Chaitali said, you can you have the feedback that you can put in and uh, you can let us know. OK, 
okay uh, what kind of questions you have but if you learn from the links that i will share so let me just share the learn link and guys please do not go anywhere you can give a practice assessment which will test your knowledge and they are very easy questions trust me it is something that you will know how to prepare on okay for the az 900 certification so if you need an exam voucher you can contact my team i think chaitali has put him uh, put her details okay her email id the company number okay you can even go to our website and you can see all that uh, and you can uh, so i'll just exam topics as a general name you can just type in the in your browser google browser or edge browser and you can get uh, the name for it so if you need an exam voucher you can mail it to us yes it is a paid this thing it's not free sadly okay uh, but if you want to practice you can do the assessment that we are giving you now okay for a uh, few i mean it's a free assessment and it is something that microsoft is providing it's not us who is providing so you can definitely take that assessment okay and try it out so just give me a minute so my colleague noor noorjia has uh, posted a link guys in the chat box please go ahead and take this assessment i am giving you all 30 minutes to do it and once you all complete the assessment please put a done in the chat box so that we come to know and we can end this session these two days of training that you had so please go ahead and practice please go ahead give this assessment and please put a screenshot of the that you have done so you get a you will get a message at the end once you complete the assessment so please put that screenshot in the chat box so that we come to know that you have completed this assessment so i'm giving you all half an hour and i will uh, start the timer so guys please go ahead and give the assessment it is absolutely free so please feel free to give it and please share please put the screenshot in the chat box so that we come to know that you have completed the assessment
Uh, guys, last 10 minutes to submit your assessment. Also, make sure you submit the uh, screenshot of the assessment once you complete it in the chat box. As I can see, two of the participants have shared the screenshot of the completion of assessment. So guys, once you complete the assessment, please share the screenshot. Thank you at, uh, everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, I have shared the link for feedback form uh, and kindly request you to fill the feedback form.
hope uh, all of the submitted the assignment. Uh, guys, as you can see on the screen, we have completed the one day of the webinar in two half a day sessions. Uh, also, we have shared the learning achievement batch. Uh, so you can do self learning on AZ 900 certification. Then uh, uh, for the mentoring and exam prep session, uh, we have added a section where you can share your queries and question. So we all can come with, uh, come up with the answers for all your questions. We'll take a all, uh, one hour exam prep session in one or two weeks for you all. So make sure you submit your questions and queries in the feedback form. Also, we have completed the knowledge assessment. If you have uh, any doubt related to this plan, please uh, you can put your questions in the chat box. If you haven't received the badge redemption link, please let me know in the chat box. I can share that with you all. Also, we have shared the assessment link with you all. So I hope you all have uh, attended the assessment. Uh, yeah, guys, I am sharing the links uh, for your reference. I am sharing the learning achievement batch as well as other details in the chat box. So you all can go and, uh, you know, get the redemption done for easy 900. Uh, yes, guys, those who have submitted the assessment, please also make sure you submit the feedback form. The link has been mentioned in the chat box for you all. Uh, this feedback form uh, link contains the section where you can put the queries and questions, which we will cover in the exam prep session. Uh, we'll let you know the date for the exam prep session on your register email address, which you have shared with us. We'll definitely come up with the answers to your questions and queries. So make sure you submit your questions and queries in the feedback form.
uh, guys to know more about the certification trainings which synergetics do also for the discounted exam voucher you all can connect with us i have mentioned the e uh, email ids as well as the whatsapp number where you can connect with us Uh, those who have submitted the assessment and uh, shared the feedback on the feedback form, you all can drop off. Thank you so much, guys, for sharing the screenshot of the assessment. Those who have yet to submit the feedback form, make sure you submit the feedback form before leaving the session. Thank you so much, guys. Also, I would like to thank Mansi for successfully conducting the two day of AZ 900. I hope all the participants have received immense knowledge uh, from her. Thank you everyone for attending this session. I had great two days. I hope you all could learn a lot. And thank you uh, Chaitali uh, for conducting this session.
and have a great time guys uh, all the best for the exam thank you